Good evening, everybody. We welcome you. My name is Sarah Kelly. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Outreach here at the Alumni Association. Um, we want to thank you for joining us um, this evening for the Florida State Demystifying Admissions webinar. We are thrilled to have you, and we are thrilled to discuss the admissions process with Hega Ferguson. For many of you, the journey with FSU begins well before setting foot on campus. College application preparations often commence as early as the first year of high school. Um, as, as a leading research university, we consistently receive a high volume of first year applicants. This year, we were pleased to receive almost 80,000, 79,400, just to be exact, um, applications for a class of 6,000 students, which is including our summer and our fall combined. Tonight, we've partnered with the FSU Office of Admissions to give you an insider's perspective on first year admissions process. Before we get started, just a few quick housekeeping points. Um, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A box um, that is located on your Zoom, and we will address those questions towards the end. Um, and then also, we just want you to know that this is being recorded, and we will upload it to the webinar resources tab on the Alumni Association website within the next week. Now, without much more time, I want to introduce our presenter uh, for this evening, Hega Ferguson. She is the Director of Admissions at Florida State University. She is originally from Norway and is a two-time FSU alumna, earning a bachelor's degree in international affairs in 1997 and a master's degree in social science in 2003. For 31 years, she has risen through the ranks from a student employee to a dedicated admissions professional and student advocate in the FSU's Office of Admissions. We're grateful for her willingness to share her expertise with us tonight. Hega, thank you so much for being here with us tonight, and we eagerly await your insights. That's great. Thank you for the kind introduction, Sarah. Um, I am entering into my 10th year as the Director of Admissions at Florida State, and and I have to say, really being the director um, at FSU and being a part of admissions has been nothing but just a, a privilege and an honor. Um, just to be able to be a part of a young people's journey as they find their place uh, in college university is just a, a tremendous joy and uh, just a lot of fun every year. Um, we have an hour where um, I'm going to share a lot of information with you. Um, and the, the difficulty part of this is that, you know, really all of the different things that we have each could be conversations lasting on for hours on end. Um, but we don't have that time. And, um, you know, I would encourage you if you do have questions um, and we are not able to answer all your questions today, I will have my contact information at the end of the presentation, and you are certainly welcome to email me, uh, call me, et cetera. Um, I think that this is one of the opportunities that we have um, to be able to provide to the friends and graduates of Florida State um, to be able to have that uh, connection with the admissions office. So um, definitely want to make sure that we try to answer everybody's questions, um, thoughts, uh, concerns about the admissions process. So we're going to dive right into it. And, and first, I just wanted to take the opportunity to acknowledge the, the many, many things that we have, um, that the university has accomplished that we can be proud of. And so these are just snapshots of different things. But I want to, in particular, highlight um, our retention rate, which is 96%. Uh, that is the rate from when students return from their freshman to their sophomore year in college. Um, that places us in the top 10 of public universities in this country. That is quite the accomplishments. But we also, uh, make amazing strides in our four-year graduation rate, which is 76%. And then while it's not listed here, the six-year graduation rate is 86%. All of these three benchmarks um, are all in the top 10 of public universities. And I think it's a is probably one of the most tangible uh, things that we can look at that really speaks to the success 
of bringing in um, the right students to the university. And then while they're here, making sure they have everything that they need in order for them to be successful students at the university. We want to start with just sort of uh, acknowledging uh, where we are with our applications. And so um, you can see we have had quite the dramatic uh, uptick in applications, 163% over the last uh, 10 years, which is significant. Um, and what that does, aside from making it a lot more um, of applications to review, it also speaks to FSU having a really a, a name recognition uh, nationally as well as international. But we're very conscious that we are a Florida public university. And so our priority will be and continue to be uh, our Florida residents. In fact, when we introduced early action a couple of years ago, we did that uh, for our Florida residents in particular, they were able to get their decisions in December as a as a, a commitment, if you will, um, to making sure that we were um, making sure that we were making the opportunities available um, for our Florida residents to get their applications and getting responses back from us as well. This is um, a lot of information about our most recent class that we brought in. So these are the students that started with us this summer and fall semester. You can see just based on the, the ranges for both summer and fall, these are very, very competitive students. Um, what you see listed is referred to as the middle 50th. And so when you're looking at this numbers, you should keep in mind that for the GPA as well as the test scores, uh, that there are 25% that had actually higher than what you see here as the data. And then there's also 25% that will have below the data that you see here. But this is really the middle 50th of our first year class. It's important to point that out as opposed to giving averages. Averages is just, just a snapshot. It really does not give the range uh, for what you are admitting of your class. So when we are presenting on information, we're always wanting to share what the middle 50th is so that students have a better understanding of sort of the range of what we had uh, for our accepted students um, for our classes. You probably know that there are um, certain courses that you will need to have in order for you um, to be a competitive applicant. And so what you see listed under the core academic courses, uh, the ones in Garnet are the minimum as um, required by the Florida Board of Governors. These are the academic units in each of the subjects that student must have in order for them to gain admission to the university. And what you see in the, the teal color is what our students have on average that we are admitted um, to the university. And so when you look at your math course and you see a minimum of four is what is required, but on average students have six math courses. Some are gonna say, well, how can that be? There's only four years in high school. And really what you're seeing is a reflection of so many students starting to take math courses already in middle school. So very often they're starting their math journey with the algebra one and the geometry before they transition to high school and then go into the algebra two, pre-calculus, trig, calculus, et cetera. And so as we will speak a little later about the holistic review process that we have, these core classes is a part of what we will take into consideration. And as we evaluate students' applications, we are looking to see how the student is performing in their academic setting. So not compared to the school down the road, but rather at the school that they are attending. 
and what is available there in terms of core classes, in terms of rigor, what do you have in terms of IB or is it dual enrollment, AP, et cetera? And how is the student chosen to challenge themselves while they are in high school? Um, and a little later, I will also speak to the importance of really having a balance. Um, we do not want students to do nothing but school all day long. Uh, we want students that are what we would call uh, well-rounded, they are engaged um, in their communities, they are doing things outside the classroom. But this gives you a pretty good snapshot of, of what we typically will see from our accepted students. I wanted to, to kind of share with you also that our, our top um, five counties that we have listed really has not changed uh, much. Miami-Dade, lots and lots of students from South Florida wanting to come to Tallahassee, um, but also significant a number of students coming from Brevard, Palm Beach, Hillsborough, and Orange County. The top states have changed a little bit, not the first three. Georgia's been our number one probably for forever. Uh, New York and New Jersey, kind of flip-flop um, just about every other year. But Texas is a new one for us. They have in the last uh, couple of years kind of inched their way into the top five uh, along with Illinois. So it's, it's one of those things that we have seen that there has been some change to North Carolina used to be in there. Um, and so, you know, we, we never know. It's from year to year can change. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see if the two these two states will um, continue to send us uh, the large number of applicants that they do. And then at the bottom of the screen, um, we um, take a lot of interest in making sure that we are able, as we are creating um, our classes, building a community, as we call it, building a class, that we are one representative of the state of Florida and our population. And so there are 67 counties in Florida and we were able to admit students from every one of the 67 counties. And that is a priority for us. And that has been in, in the works for several years um, because we didn't start out with being able to admit all students from the 67 counties. And so digging into the data, reaching out to the counties, working with high schools, we have now been able um, to attract applications uh, from all the 67 counties, but even more importantly, very well qualified applicants from all the counties, um, which is, is been a wonderful accomplishment for us. We are also getting applications and being able to admit students from every one of the 50 states um, here in the U.S. And, and that's significant because I'm not so sure that I would have thought that we would have a, a footprint, if you will, in the in the Dakotas for, as an example. But, but we do. Um, and um, that's something that has been uh, something that we've been watching as well, having that great reach. And so in terms of admitting students, you see we'll admit students from a rather large number of U.S. high school, um, 2,800 plus um, high schools uh, were able to have students being admitted from Florida State. So really a, a diverse uh, group of students coming from everywhere, contributing um, to our communities, um, and is definitely a, a big part of how we're building our, our class. You'll also see the, the admit rates. And I was meeting with a, a young lady and her parents um, earlier this week, and I was kind of surprised when she asked me about admit rates. And I kind of had to say to her, you know, I don't really want you to have to worry about admit rates. You, the, what you should be worrying about is putting your best forth, foot forward. You know, have you done the best that you could do in high school? You've taken your test scores. You've been engaged in different types of clubs and organizations. Um, and that's, that's all that anybody really can ask of you. So don't worry about our acceptance rates. 
and use that as something to be really nervous about. Really just focus on what you can control, which is your own application and your own performances. And that's what we are looking at when we are reviewing applications. We're not looking um, to have a low acceptance rate. We, we this last year, admitted more than 18,000 students for our class of 6,000 students. So in some ways, we operate a, a bit like an airline. We will overbook um, because we will have students that will be able to gain acceptance at, at several different institutions. They have different choices, and we know that. Um, but uh, we really also uh, want to make sure that students know that in all of this, we are really just looking at their accomplishments and what they're presenting to us as part of their application. So with that in mind, I do think it's important to just kind of take a minute to just reflect over that 80% of all four-year institutions accept more than 50% of their applicants. So what you read in the papers are all the Ivy, law, Ivy League schools with you know, a 3% acceptance rate, a 5% acceptance rates, et cetera. But in reality, uh, most of all the college and universities are gonna be admitting more than 50% um, of their students. So they are definitely colleges um, they are there admitting students. And so if you want to go to college, you will be able to gain acceptance at a college and university. Um, you know, the, the, the question will be, you know, what are the schools that, you know, may be perhaps a little bit more of a stretch uh, for you? And that's going to vary um, from really from year to year. And that speaks to the second part of this. Admission criteria changes each cycle. Uh, we had a question earlier today that was asking if, if we thought that the fall uh, profile would be even more selective uh, this year. And I, I really don't know. I, I will not know until probably in December when we have completed the evaluations of all our applications uh, for early action. Um, that's when we have a much better idea of what is the, the quality of our applicant pool. And that will vary and can vary from year to year. FSU have had, I would say, um, that there have been incremental um, increases in our selectivity from year to year. Um, but it's definitely not something that we would take for granted. And then I think thirdly, it's just really important to know that there are uh, often very much different types of pathways for students to, to come to the university that they have their hearts set on attending. Um, and that is also the case for Florida State. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit later in the presentation. Okay, so kind of switching gears a little bit into, you know, how do we prepare um, for this admission cycle, if you will? The first thing is read your emails and check your portals. And when we know that students on average will submit um, six applications um, for the, for their, as part of their senior year, that means that they will also have emails coming from all the six schools. They will have six different student portals. That's a lot to keep track of. And so the struggle for us at the university side is that we have a lot of information that we want to share with the stu student, but also often with the family members. And so we keep sending emails. Sometimes we'll switch it over to text because we can kind of see if the student is opening their emails, clicking on the links that we have provided, et cetera. And so we, we do pay attention to that, but it is really, really important that the student read all the emails and that they check their portals because even in their portals is where they will see what, if anything, is missing from their application, 
And that's also where they will find out their admissions decision. So making sure that they are on track with that, that will be important. Pay attention to deadlines. You know, six different schools, six different deadlines. I know it's a lot to keep track of. And, and that's where I'll have some moms that are really very good with their Excel spreadsheets and have all the deadlines and everything mapped out, you know, whatever you need to do in order for you to stay on top of it. But recognizing that the deadlines are there for a reason um, and making sure that you get everything in before the deadline. I always say, you know, the students that are waiting until the day of the deadline to submit the application, that always just makes me a little bit nervous because what if something did not come through as they should have? You know, now you are after the deadline. So make sure that you get it in well before then. Be thoughtful in creating the list of schools. Like be realistic and, and be, having done your research as to what schools are on your list. Should you apply to 20 different schools? I think that that's a bit excessive, but there may be some that um, are applying for very niche type of programs. So the first thing that would come to mind would be a musical theater program, for instance. That may be something that they need to do. Um, but that is not the norm, and that is no reason for it. I think you really have done your research. Hopefully you visited the school, um, and you have a good idea what they're looking for, and that there's something about that school that you are, are interested in and see as potentially a place that could be your home away from home. Um, so be thoughtful of that. Don't just throw on schools on there just to... Uh, do what we kind of call collecting another acceptance. Um, because as you're collecting another acceptance, that's also keeping somebody else from receiving that spot. Really important that the student understands and knows that we are expecting a high achieving student um, to continue to be a high achieving during the senior year. So, if you're an A and B student, we are expecting to see A's and B's in the senior year as well. We definitely do not want to, to see uh, students that are perhaps receiving grades uh, that are not up to par. And I would say in general, any grades below a C is cause uh, for the possibility of having their offer of admissions rescinded. And trust me, those are the absolute worst phone calls to make because you don't find that out usually until we receive the final transcripts, which typically are not available until May and June. And so that's not leaving a lot of time um, to make alternate plans. So making sure getting good grades all throughout the senior year. And then I think lastly, focus on the fit. I think that's really, really important in this whole process of uh, looking at colleges. What is the best fit for you? Not what's the best fit for your friends or your parents or your grandparents or anybody else, but for you, what are you looking for? And what would you like to see being that place where you wanna be for the next four years? So really kind of taking all of those things into consideration um, and making sure that you are really thoughtful um, about the process and staying organized. And it really truly will make it uh, a bit easier to navigate. So these are all the things that we know from conversations with people that what people think that we look like. So, you know, they think definitely test score is a big thing. Next, GPA, somewhat extracurriculars, huge, particularly, you almost have to be, you know, the president of your student government. Um, and then we'll also then look at the essay and then also legacy. So that's what people think. But what we really look at is much more complex. And I think that, you know, that is the part of, of the world of admissions that um, people sometimes don't um, 
perhaps appreciate as much. Um, but there are so much that we are looking at that we are bringing to the table as part of our holistic review process. And so, you know, you can see here, there is that really that big focus on the academic part, which does include an academic core GPA. But what can be confusing is that the GPA that we are using for admissions purposes is not going to be the same GPA that's on the report card, that's on the high school transcript, because our GPAs are recalculated using only academic core classes, which are going to be courses in the English, the math, natural sciences, social sciences, and world languages. So what you saw earlier in the presentation, those academic core areas. And so we'll look at that. We'll look at the grade trends. We're definitely paying attention to the strength of the curriculum or what's being offered at the school. Is the student in an IB program? Are they taking AP classes? Are honors courses the highest level um, that is available um, for the student at the high school? We've got to be paying attention to that. Um, all the non-academic factors that we look at, and we really are just, um, you know, looking at the essay, what is being shared with us, looking at the extracurricular activities, and frankly, just look at it to see how's the student choosing to spend their time outside the classroom. Um, and that really kind of speaks to, you know, the student's interest, um, what, you um, Perhaps they are planning to continue on uh, with, you know, in, in college. And so you see this, it's, it's much more complex, much more nuanced um, than what people in general will think about. So as we are looking at the holistic review process for Florida State, um, we base our holistic process on the institutional core values. And you, you will recognize them as a graduate, um, as the three torches in the university seal. Um, and so those are the Veras, Artes, Mores. And so um, the Veras was really speaks to the strength. And really in that area is where we are focusing on um, pulling out the, the rigor for what the student has, um, challenge, how they challenge themselves in, in high school. What are the grades that they're earning? What are the grade trends? You know, maybe they started off in the, in the freshman year in high school and maybe had um, some little wobbles there with some grades. But since then, they, they are doing awesome. We will look at that. And that's, that's a good thing. I want to see. I want to see a positive grade trend. It will definitely be an area of concern if this happens in the junior year of a student. So if those grades in the junior year perhaps are slipping a little bit, that will give us some pause for, for concerns for sure. Important to note that when we evaluate the student, we are evaluating the student in the context of their high school, not the school down the street or across the state or in another state for that matter. It's only based on the school that the student is attending. And I know we had a question earlier today that asked if there was a limit for how many students we would admit for each school. And as I said, no, because if the school just have great students, we want to admit the great students. And so no, we do not have uh, what some will refer to as a quota system um, and only will admit X number of students from each school. And I think very often for, if you speak with high school counselors, they will also tell you that the numbers can vary from year to year. Um, and that's just also um, in, in just looking at what the, the quality of the applicant pool that is um, sending applications to, to Florida State. Um, I think the second part of this is the artist, where we really kind of reference that as being um, skills. And that's really looking at the student and what they're doing outside the classroom. Um, clubs, sports, um, family responsibilities, um, employment, uh, really any kind of achievement. And, and again, there is no such thing as you know, you have to be the president of the student government 
or uh, you have to play uh, soccer. It's really a, a great variety. And I think very often um, when we see that in particular for our, our graduates is that, you know, we are, our community has really just a, a diverse group of people with different interests. And so we want to make sure that we are able to admit the students that love to play guitar. And then we also got a space for people that like to play soccer and do a lot of sports. And those students that want to uh, do volunteer work and community service, all of this. So we want to make sure that we have a good representation um, as we're building our class and, and university. And then lastly, the last horse that we're looking at is the Morris, which really speaks to character. And so this is the part that is, is a lot of actually fun because this is the part that the students have a great voice in. This is their essay. This is their voice. This is their opportunity to share with us um, what they feel we should know about them. And so I think it's it's important for them to know that we are expecting them to provide us with the information about them that is authentic to their themselves. So someone who is 17, maybe 18 years old. Um, that's what we are expecting. We we are not expecting an essay that is written in the voice of someone who's 45 or 50 years old. Um, we do get some questions about if we will be checking for chat GPT use of uh, that for essays. And, um, you know, I will tell you that, um, you know, you can very often, when you read as many essays as we do, you learn uh, pretty quickly uh, to decipher what is more in the, the voice of what you would expect for an applicant versus somebody that is using ChatGPT. And so while we were not broadly sent all our applications through um, AI, um, it's kind of search for it, um, we will and have been um, very much finding uh, those areas where it clearly is not written by the student. And so we want the student to, to take this opportunity to share information about them um, and, you know, having it be in their voice. And as I say very often, you know, if this is your opportunity to share something about yourself that you wish that I would know about you, this is the time. This is the time for you to share that with us. So make sure you use that, that space and that time um, wisely um, because this is your time um, for us to learn more about you as, as a person. Some of you are familiar with uh, what we have been using now for a number of years, and this is the self-reported student academic record. And so I think um, I wanted to take this opportunity to, to share this with you because um, one, you know, the, the, the family members of students they did not do self-reported student academic records. So there is a little bit of that uncertainty. How does this work? What does it look like? Um, you know, the faith of just um, accepting student uh, information. And so the, the self-reported student academic record um, is, is an opportunity for the student to take their existing high school transcript. So they should all be using their high school transcript Definitely not their memory because, you know, sometimes the memories are not as good and then that can go terribly wrong. But using the high school transcript as their guide, they will complete this, this web form that is through the self-reported student academic record. What, does do, what this does for us is that it actually will go ahead and then make this as a streamlined process because believe it or not, high school transcripts comes in all sizes and shapes 
and in all very different formats. And so this allows us to pull all this information in in the same format. And it's also dynamic. So we are able to query on this information. And so we are able to, um, for instance, say, you know, give me all students at X school that have taken calculus. And they are able to pull that information from this data. They cannot do that from a high school transcript. And so this is really uh, an opportunity for you to see what it looks like on my end. So when you are completing the self-reported student academic record, this is how, is how it translates on my end. And I think, you know, for someone like me who's done this for, for many, many years, you know, to me, this is just very easy to read. Um, it's color coded, which really speaks to the rigor. Um, of the curriculum. Um, and so you are quickly able to see this student has a lot of rigor. They really have challenged themselves um, significantly. And then it's broken down by the different areas. So you can really see very quickly um, that the student has continued to take classes in most areas. And of course, you can also see their grades. So you're able to quickly see their grade point average and then down at the bottom, you will see that it, it calculates on um, two different GPAs based on this information. And remember when I said earlier, the, the GPA that we use for evaluation purposes is gonna be different than the report card or the transcript. That's what this is. This is the recalculated academic GPA where we will add extra weight um, to all courses, there are um, IB, there are AP, they're part of the Cambridge ACE program, as well as dual enrollment. And so the Florida Board of Governors have a set of standard that tells all the 12 state universities um, how to weight courses and specifically how much weight should be given. And so all of those ACE, AP, IB, dual enrollment, are weighted one whole point. So essentially, we are operating on a five point scale. And so that's where you're seeing where, you know, the, the GPA ranges are, are well above 4.0 because we are on a five point scale. But we do also look at the unweighted GPA. Um, but I will tell you um, when someone tells me about, you know, I have a student with a 4.6 GPA, when you do something like this, you do not know what a 4.6 GPA, exactly what curriculum that is a, been a part of. What is the rigor? You do not know what courses that the student has completed. You do not know the grade trend um, that the student have had. So just the number 4.6 as a GPA does not necessarily mean that that is a student that I would say you would be fully admissible to the university. So um, just kind of mentioning that as, as, as something that I think is important to keep in mind and, and also recognizing that GPA is just one of many factors that we look at. Test scores are required um, in the state of Florida. All the, the 12 uh, universities require test scores and, and have for the longest time, even uh, through the pandemic. I wanted to point out that last year, the CLT, the classical learning test, was approved as a third testing option. Um, so students um, certainly can take that as well. Um, it's one, one, we do not require all three test scores. Um, I typically will tell students that I don't know a test score that you're gonna score the highest on. So, you know, I would uh, try more than one. And then, you know, unless you're scoring a perfect score, there's chances are that you're gonna wanna retake your test score um, because we will also super score. Uh, which means that we take the highest subscores. So your, your writing and your English is one section, and then you have a math is another section for the SAT. 
and we will take the highest for all the attempts that you have. And so that really allows students to take a test for multiple time to be able to improve their test score, uh, even if they're able to just only increase one section of it. Um, and so we definitely use the, the super scoring. And then we also allow students to self-report uh, their test scores as well, um, so that we don't have to worry about the additional cost at time of application that they may have to occur um, in having to have test scores sent to us. And so that's an important part of it. Using their score reports and reporting their test scores uh, would be something that um, we would want our students to do. For the list that we talk about, resume, list of activities, et cetera, you know, I kind of hesitate a little bit now to say resume because I've, I've heard uh, too many stories about students who are just, you know, sweating over trying to make a professional resume almost equivalent to somebody's graduating for high school. And that's not what we're expecting. Um, it really can be just really as a simple of just listing um, the different types of activities, clubs, sports, volunteering. And so what you see is in an example here is for a student that completed that through the Common App. And so that's how the information is displayed for us as we are evaluating uh, their application. And so looking at the, the broad range of what they've done, um, what have they um, been able to participate in terms of leadership role? How long have they been a part of it? You know, if this is something where we see that the student up until their senior year really didn't do anything, but in their senior year, they're all of a sudden a part of five different organizations, you know, that that that's not really what we were looking for. We were really looking for the students to been able to to do things all throughout their high school. That's something that we feel is important. And then, of course, we look at everything that uh, speaks to what the student has accomplished. And so, um, you know, those students that are competing, whether it's the sports or the spelling bee or is Boy Scout, Girl Scouts, et cetera, all of those things are, are things that the students should be included, um, include on their application and, and what we will take into consideration. And then, of course, the essay, trying to um, really, you know, respond to these prompts. And so, you know, who is the, the primary subject of the essay? We want to know about you. Um, very often, um, students will want to write about, um, you know, their their grandparents. Sometimes they've experienced loss for their first time, and and we know that that is um, traumatic. Um, however, um, if you are taking the time to to focus on somebody else, it's taken away from learning for us, learning about you. So make sure you talk about you. This is the good time for you to be selfish um, and speak about you. Um, and then really, you know, what, what are you trying to share with us? What is it that you want us to know about you? And then does it, what is the time period? You know, this happened when you were in an elementary school or, or is this in while you were in high school? Um, and then also, you know, what is it that um, it, you know, this is sharing with us? Like, why did you choose to share this information? What does it highlight that is not available uh, in the rest of your application materials? Um, wanted to just make sure that you kind of had a chance to look to see what an application portal looks like. This is FSU's application portal. And so this is where we, we personalize it. And so we will have uh, the name of the student. Um, and so that will be uh, right there uh, on top of as you log again. Um, and then we will give some summary of the application details that you'll see there. You'll see a lovely picture um, of the admissions counselor that is assigned to your area. And that is definitely a person that um, the student can reach out to um, with, with any questions that they have your application. And then we also want to share the application status so that the student sort of knows where they are in the process. 
Um, I think that's they feel that you know this seeing that this is moving towards um, that that point of where they're receiving their decision, and then also with the application checklist. You know, we believe that um, having red X's that means so that things that are outstanding that you need to get completed, and the green little check mark says that you know we received everything that we need, and so um, really that's what we're looking for. We're making want to make sure that you have. Uh, all but green check marks on your application. And so making sure that you check your portal, um, you should definitely do that um, every week. I'm not saying you need to do it every day, but you definitely need to be checking it in every week. And then just um, quickly, um, because I know um, most uh, are going to want to know about this, these are our application deadlines. So this is FSU's application deadline. We are doing early action, as I mentioned, for Florida residents. Um, I will tell you that a number of um, public universities in Florida are following uh, our lead and are also starting this year of doing early action. In fact, I think nine of the 12 public universities are going to be doing early action this year. Um, and so regular decision will be for uh, those students that are out of state um, or internationally, as well as those Florida residents that did not uh, get their application completed by the October 22nd. And so uh, we have the deadlines um, outlined here. The material deadlines is giving them a week from the deadline originally. So for early action, the deadline to apply is October the 15th. And then by October 22nd, their application needs to be complete. All green check marks. We will accept additional test scores through December 1st. And so students that are retesting can still submit their application early. Um, and then when they get their test scores, they can log into their portal and self-report their test scores. And then of course you see, you know, as we are releasing our decisions for early action, it will be December the 12th. For regular decision, it will be February the 13th. And then for rolling a decision, uh, we release those decisions usually in early to mid-April. Just quickly, um, as I know that we are, um, you know, approaching the time, um, a lot of people have heard about our spring transfer program that is now called the FSU Next program. And I'm super excited about this change because we are now adding um, a class that these students that are attending Tallahassee State College for the fall semester as a full-time student, they are also gonna be taking a class at FSU in the fall semester. And they will also be able to get their FSU card made. They're also having an opportunity to participate in, in clubs and organizations. And so we want to, through this program, be able to sort of bring them in um, and have that connection um, with our FSU community. So when they transfer to FSU in January, they're feeling very comfortable, know what the expectations are, and are ready to, to go as, as a full FSU student. We also are now allowing students, this is new this year, that students have the opportunity to be considered for both summer and fall. And this is what it looks like on the common application as well as our institutional application. So students this year do now have the opportunity to, if they do not meet fall, they can be automatically considered for the summer if they check the box that says, yes, that's what I would like. And for those students who only want to be considered for their particular term, they have the opportunity to provide that to us as well. And that's what we will keep in mind as we're making our decision. Um, some of you will have heard that our pathways, uh, which is called the Seminole Pathways, that is an umbrella um, for several pathways to the university. And so we included on the application this year uh, an opportunity for students to learn about these programs. And that comes from students uh, and their family members in the past um, saying that, gosh, I wish I had known about these pathways 
prior to the decision being released to them. And so indicating that they have an interest in learning more does not have any um, bearing on the decision that is going to be rendered, but it does allow us to share information about the specific programs. I know I kind of had to race at the end there, Sarah, um, to try to make sure that we are leaving plenty of time for, for questions. Um, and so I think that that's where we're at. Um, wanted to just make sure that everybody has my email address. I do answer my own emails and that is also my direct phone number. And so um, I definitely uh, appreciate if you have questions, thoughts, anything you want to share with me to also be in contact with me. I think that's that's one of the things that I enjoy as being part of, um, you know, the admissions at, at FSU. Wonderful. Hega, thank you so much. Um, every time we hear this, it just gets better and better and more exciting um, to hear about this application process and, you know, so informative. Um, we do have quite a few questions um, that has come through. Uh, <laughs> audience, we may not get to every single question um, just due to time, um, and some may be duplicates that may be answered through another question. Um, but if we don't get to something, I'm just going to reiterate, always reach out to Hega just through her email or give her a call. Um, her team and herself are just wonderful um, and they usually respond fairly quickly as well. I'd say under 24 hours, you'll get your response back. So um, we will jump into a few of your questions. Um, Hego, the first one is, if a student auditions for a BFA program, which is quite selective and does not get into that program, does that hurt their chances of getting into the university? Um. It depends. <laughs> and that's kind of where those gray areas, right? And so um, what we what we try to do is we want the students that are applying to um, the selective special talent programs to be considered um, for um, that program. But we also recognize that there are also sometimes opportunities through a BA program, for instance. And so maybe they did not gain admission to the BFA program, but the program said, you know, I think the BA program would be a great opportunity for them. Or it could also be that the student is saying, you know, I thought that's what I wanted, but I'm not. I'm not sure that it is my first choice. Maybe, maybe I'm in, maybe I should just be undecided and I'm not sure. Um, and that's okay too. We will definitely look at and provide students an opportunity to um, come to the university, but they would have to then change their major. And so the idea uh, is that if they are fully admissible on their own, that we want to give them an opportunity um, to have a different major so that it won't be just if the BFA program says no, that and it is just no period. We try to to see if there's other opportunities for the student as well. Great. Next question is, I heard legacy applicants at FSU have a bit of an advantage. How do you let FSU know that you are a second or third generation applicant and have a sibling that is currently attending? And there's quite a few different questions about legacy, booster related, you know, those kinds of questions. So how do those students really um, stand out on their applications? Yeah, and, and I really think that that's, um, an opportunity through um, their essay, to be honest with you. Um, legacy is, is not something that we ask uh, on the admissions application. And in fact, there are now five states already that have banned um, legacy as, as being a part of the application. Um, and so, uh, what we are always looking for is we, we always want to make sure that, you know, we are providing uh, the service to the, the students that have family members that have attended the FSU to find opportunities um, where we can, um, you know, look for ways to, to come to Florida State. We can't admit somebody um, 
solely because they have family members that have attended the university in the past. Um, the application is the student's application and they are presenting uh, to us their accomplishments. But it's always, I think, a wonderful opportunity through the essay, through their voice, to share how their FSU experience have shaped them as, as a person, um, as their families. You know, there are so many wonderful stories about, you know, people that met each other in college and they married and, you know, they have several generations that have now attended Florida State um, and really have spoken also to how FSU um, has shaped their lives. And so I think that that's a great opportunity for the student to, to include that information. Um, I will also tell you that this year, uh, for those students that are being deferred, which is really, we're not making a decision in December. We're saying, hold on, we just, we need some more information from you. And one of those things that we will be asking for this year is really for the student um, to be able to submit a short little essay they really taught, or a video rather, that, that why FSU? And that's one of the things that we, we really like to know about. Like, wh why are you applying to Florida State? Share with me, why is FSU important? And I think, I think the essay is a good place for that. Great. We also have a few questions about housing. Um, <laughs> that always comes up around this time when you're looking at your applications and trying to figure everything out. Yeah. Um, a lot of it is, you know, do you have to be admitted for applying for housing? And then also, does housing deposits need to be made at the same time as applications? So we're just kind of talking through that process. Yeah, and I and I think uh, part of that confusion too is because universities are all doing it differently, right? Um, and so at FSU, um, students have to be admitted first before they can apply for housing. And in fact, housing for our first year students do not open up until the end of February. And then so in that way, students that are applying um, and getting their decision through regular decision, which is the decisions are um, being released in, in February the 13th, um, when housing application opens up for our accepted students, it will then be made available for the first time for those students that were admitted in December as part of early action and those students, they were admitted in February as part of regular decision. Um, and only at that time will they submit uh, their housing and we call it a contract. And that's essentially what it is. And that is separate from what we also refer to as the, the admissions deposit. The admissions deposit is the money, it's a $200 that you put down if you decided that FSU is, that's where I'm going. I know that's where I'm going and I'm gonna pay my $200 and that is reserving my spot in the first year class. You can do your housing contract um, without doing the admissions deposit. Those are not, having to be linked together. Um, and so just wanted to make sure we knew that there's a difference between those two, two things. Perfect. We have time for probably about two to three more. Um, there's a few questions talking about the pathways, the new um, pathways that we have. So one of those that they're asking is, how do the requirements for pathways differ than standard admissions? And then also the other ones are looking at, does the Common App allow students to apply for Pathways and FSU Next programs? So just yeah. kind of wrapping. Yeah, that's and that's a great question. Um, so Seminole Pathways is the umbrella for four different um, pathways to FSU. Pathways to, and, and, and the Seminole Pathways is something that we decide. Students cannot apply for that. So it's something that we in the admissions office will decide uh, who will be extended 
um, seminal pathways. And so um, we expect that when we give decisions in December for early action, that will be the decisions we will be planning on giving will be your admits, they will be deferred students, there will be students that will be offered seminal pathways, and then there will be students that we're having to say no to, um, but they will be offered the path of um, the Aspire, TCC Aspire program, allowing them to transfer to FSU after earning the AA degree. And so for the four options that are part of seminal pathways, it's allowing students to pick one of the four. Um, and so like the first one would be um, going to the FSU Panama City campus. So I have spaces available at the Panama City campus. And so that student would start in the summer at the Panama City campus and would then also be there in the fall semester and then uh, typically in the spring and then would be eligible if they chose to, um, to transition to the Tallahassee campus or if they want to stay in Panama City and earn their bachelor's degree, they can do that as well. So that's one pathway. The two next pathways are through our study abroad international programs. So FSU have four full-time study centers in the world, um, London, Valencia in Spain, Florence in Italy, and the Republic of Panama. And so there are two options. Students would start in the summer by taking an online class. And it's really more of a preparation for your study abroad experience. And then for your first semester abroad, you would go to one of these study centers and that's where you would spend your fall semester. And then in January, you are on the Tallahassee campus. The year long program is where saying, starting the summer with an online class um, that is really preparation for studying abroad and then going abroad fall and spring and then being on the Tallahassee campus um, in the following fall. I do get questions from students that often will ask if, can they be at two different campuses? So could you do London, for instance, for the fall and, and doing Valencia in the spring? And yes, you can. You don't have to be at the same campus um, if you're doing the year long program. So as you could tell from these first three options, you are an FSU student. You're starting as an FSU student. You're just not here on the Tallahassee campus because I don't I don't have enough space um, for those students for them. The last and final uh, pathway is what used to be the spring transfer option. And we have named that now the FSU Next Program. And that's where the student will be a full-time student um, at Tallahassee State College, they will be taking 12 to 15 credit hours, usually the same type of classes that they would have taken here at Florida State. And then in addition, they will be taking a one hour course um, that they will be taking here on the FSU campus. It's in person. Um, and that's a course that is sort of colloquium style, if you will. This will also then allow students to get their FSU card. They can use the library. Um, they can uh, participate in, in clubs and organizations. They cannot do rush. They cannot join a sorority and fraternity, uh, but there will be some rushing activities um, in, in January. And we will definitely having speakers come in um, as part of our, our class to talk about the, the Greek uh, experience at Florida State. Um, and so we're really excited about that program. Uh, and the typically the students that are selected uh, for the pathways, these are the students that would fall below our accepted student profile for summer and fall. Um, but looking at their academic performance uh, and everything as part of our holistic review, we feel strongly 
that they still would be a good fit with our university. And so by offering them the seminal pathways, we are allowing them uh, to be able to join FSU uh, sooner than, than having to wait for two years to, to earn the AA degree. So we have one final question because I'm seeing a few of these pop through. Um, it's about AP classes. A lot of people are wondering about AP versus dual enrollment versus honors. You know, how are those viewed as from an admissions perspective? Um, would you rather see a B in an AP class or an A in an honors? What does that whole process look like for you guys on the admission side? Yeah, you know, that question has probably been around ever since I've ever been in admissions. I hear that every year. Um, and the truth is, is, you know, I want to see a student getting an A in an AP class, you know. Um, and so the really, I think the most important thing is um, figuring what is the best curriculum for the student. And so IB, for instance, as an example, is no doubt one of the most rigorous academic curriculums in the world. But not everybody is going to want to do IB. I remember one year I had a dad call me. His, his student had been in pre-IB, so the first two years in high school, and was thinking, should he should he go full IB or should he um, do the AP program? And the, the dad said, you know, the student was really struggling because with IB, because of the rigor of it and the demands were being made, he was not able to uh, pursue his guitar playing. And he was really sad about that. Um, because he felt that that was a big part of his life. And so, you know, having those conversations, you know, really in the end, it was, you know, he was able to get the rigor through the AP program and pursue also something that he loved, which was guitar playing. And so, you know, as, as students and their family members make the decision, um, you know, you know your child the best. Um, and I think you just need to figure out which, what is the best fit for the student. And, and that's, I think, what is really, really important to keep in mind. I don't, I don't have a preference of one over the other. You know, Florida Board of Governors says that they are all weighted the same. They're all considered um, being, you know, rigorous. The only thing I will say about dual enrollment is that dual enrollment is different from taking IB and AP courses in the sense that dual enrollment start, these are real college level courses. So these are courses that the student will have with them for the rest of your life. So you are essentially needing to make sure that you are getting good grades in the college level courses, because if you don't have a good experience, um, then that course is gonna be with you still and as part of your academic background for the rest of your life. And so I think it's really important to keep in mind that you know th this is a college level course. Um, it's often taught at a college, sometimes it's, taught at the high school, um, but often it's taught at, at a college. And, you know, they don't know the difference between who's a high school student and who's the college student. And they, and they shouldn't have to make differentiations. But um, knowing that you could have uh, a slip up and, you know, maybe receive a, a D in an English course, and then that D is going to be with you throughout your whole academic career um, is something I think is very important to keep in mind. For some, it's great. They are ready. The dual enrollment provides them uh, with uh, sometimes the only opportunity for rigor. By all means, you should do it. 
Um, but, you know, be very thoughtful as you're making your decisions, um, you know, as to what you want to do. And then lastly, I, I would say as well, uh, and I've mentioned early on in the presentation, I think it's really important that students and the family members hear from us at the college side and admission side that we want students to have a healthy balance in their lives. Mental health for students is very, very important. And we do not want students to be so feeling so um, sort of pushed, if you will, um, to where it's negatively impacting um, their mental health. So making sure that there is a balance, it's that balance of perhaps um, being able to, to challenge yourself, but not so much that you are losing sleep. You're not getting enough sleep. And, and I know that because I have, I have a teenager, I have a senior in myself this year. And so, you know, we know already that with high school starting so early, um, you know, they seemingly are not getting enough sleep. And so you just want to make sure that there is that balance, um, that they're pushed, but not too much where it is negatively impacting their quality of life. Haga, thank you so much. I, we could go another hour, I think, with yeah. questions. People are really excited. Um, I know we weren't able to get to everything, but you all have her information. Please reach out. Uh, she will be more than happy to help you um, in any way possible. Um, we just want to remind you that this was recorded. Um, so you will be able to go back and look at all of the slides and go back through everything um, if you just forgot something or maybe came in a little bit later. Um, so you will have that. It will be on the Alumni Association's website under webinar resources. Um, give us about a week and we will have that recording up for you. Um, but we are so grateful that you chose to spend a little over an hour with us tonight. Um, we encourage you to explore the admissions website, which is admissions.fsu.edu. Um, and then also just explore the Alumni Association website with Student Alumni Association. There's great ways for you to get involved on campus. Um, even some of you alum that are on here, great ways to get involved with clubs and networks in your area um, and go ahead and start building that love for Florida State with your family um, by going to all of those. So thank you so much. Thank you, Haga, for everything. Um, and as, as always, go Knowles. Thank y'all so much.